What's going on, everybody? Another great show, another great guest today. Dylan Graff coming from USA Today, the Badger Wire. We're going to get into uh, the, the off-season coaching rearrangement. And did the Badgers kind of bungle how they, they pulled this off? All that and more on today's Locked on Badgers. You are Locked on Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for making Locked On Badgers your first listen every day. Free and available wherever you get podcasts. Free and available on YouTube. Really appreciate all the support that you guys have given the show. Um, a big guest today we're going to bring right in, Dylan Graf, uh, USA Today, the Badger Wire. One of the sharpest Badger minds uh, that I follow on Twitter. Somebody I really wanted to bounce some stuff off of. Um, Dylan, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, the Badgers shuffled a bunch of coaching positions in the offseason. Uh, primarily on the offensive side. I just... From the the thirty thousand foot view, do you like what they did? You know, they obviously needed to make some changes. They needed to reinvigorate things. It was a pretty rough year offensively, specifically in the passing game. I don't. I, I understand every coaching hire that was made. However, a few of them, you know, are a little bit a little bit puzzling. You got a guy like Chris Herring moving over to tight ends coach, uh, you know, a spot that he has never coached. You got Al Johnson coming in coaching running backs, position that he has never coached, nor did he play. I, It's not that I dislike any of the hires, but I don't know that I'm in love with how everything shook out. Yeah, I think you and I are, are kind of similar on this. I, I like a lot of the individual pieces, but kind of like I said earlier to you, uh, I don't know if I like how the symphony's arranged here. And I want to do, I do want to give Paul Chris credit, right? Like there was a problem and he definitely made moves to address the problem. We did not stand pat. And I think that deserves um, some recognition here. Absolutely. However, however, yeah. But the problem is to me, even a guy like Ingram, I don't know. I'm going to ask you about him next. I love bringing Bobby Ingram in. I love the culture he comes from in the NFL he's never been an offensive coordinator or a quarterback's coach. Like why wouldn't you bring him in and let him be the tight ends coach, which he's done in the NFL. And we had an opening. I'm curious with that one. What were your thoughts on Bobby Ingram coming in, coaching essentially two roles he's never done before? Yeah, that I, I kind of thought it was going to be a foregone conclusion that he'd be coaching tight ends. Truthfully, you know, he's obviously coached both wide receivers and tight ends in the NFL. He's been in the NFL coaching for over a decade never coaching the quarterback. So I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure why they settled on that. Now, obviously anyone who has sat down and listened to the man speak knows that he's incredibly sharp. He has a lot of bright ideas. He's been surrounded by a winning culture in Baltimore and he's got a lot of unique ideas, things he's trying to implement things that Wisconsin desperately needs. I mean, they're coming off a year where they were 120th in passing offense and they were outside the top 100 in passing efficiency the offense needed some new blood and they were able to both find somebody from outside of their coaching tree a little bit, but also still had connections with Chris. Hopefully, hopefully he'll be able to do some good work with Mertz. He, he, the offense needs him. Let me ask you this. Do you feel like, um, I don't know the best way to work phrases, but that these are kind of just safe hires. You know, Al Johnson is a, a Chris guy. Moving Herring over. Herring is obviously one of Chris' best friends. Bringing Ingram in. You know, he's worked with Ingram before. His son is on the roster. Do you think the criticism that Chris is at times uncomfortable going outside of his comfort zone is warranted or fair? I I do. I, I think that they're both, they're both fair. Um, you know, obviously anybody wants to be surrounded by people that they trust, people that they know. It's hard to go outside of that web at times, but it just seems like he's a little too reliant on it. You know, this is running back you, and you have to imagine there would have been some intriguing applicants for a position like the running backs coach at Wisconsin, you know, replacing a guy like Gary Brown, who was also an NFL running backs coach. Perhaps he's had his eye on a guy like Al Johnson for a while, but it just seems like that was an uninspiring hire. Yeah, I think that's probably the one that most Badger fans, I would say, raise an eyebrow at. I mean, Ingram coming in, yeah, again, I think the quarterback fit is weird, but I, I don't mind the fact that he's never been an offensive coordinator before. I think he's been an offensive guy his entire life going back to the Big Ten, and he's been in a really good offensive system with Baltimore. I think he's going to bring interesting things to the offense. I think 
I still think that that home run or that hires a home run. Um, is there anyone else in the coaching moves that is it Ingram for you? Who? What is your favorite coaching move here on the offensive My side? My favorite coaching move was was an internal one, and it was just moving Bob Bostad back to mm. the offensive line. I mean, no disrespect to Joel Rudolph. He did a lot of great things at Wisconsin, but Bob Bostad knows how to get the most out of the players that he's had. He's turned a lot lesser players coming out of high school into NFL talents, all Americans. And there's a, the cupboard is hardly bare right now. There are a lot of four and five star prospects on the team. And I I like that he is trying to slot them into where he thinks they project best long-term rather than having them play at multiple different positions and not truly mastering one. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think I think Bosa moving over is going to be incredible. I I think it's a home run hire. How about how about this one? Um, is there a chance that let me let me think of this? The the offense just get Mertz just gets better because the offensive line plays better and the receiving core is better. Like let's say Ingram. Uh, let me phrase this a different way. Let's say Bobby Ingram is not really ready to be a, a really impactful quarterbacks coach yet. Couldn't he just get better because everything around him gets better? Absolutely. I I expect that if for no other reason than exactly that, that Mertz will have a better season. I mean, obviously his greatest struggles came early in the season when the offensive line was in flux. And as things kind of settled down, we saw him improve. I mean, he had a really good six, seven game stretch there in the middle of the season. Mm -hmm. We were winning games and I truly believe that we're going to have a better offensive line this season. And I think both said's a big reason of that. And if the offensive line is better, the offense as a whole will be better. Yeah, everything will come together much cleaner. I, I also think starting off the season, man, with a couple, I don't want to say cupcakes, but it gets, the offense is going to have time to get into a rhythm. It's going to have time to gel, whereas last season they just got punched in the head, and I don't think they ever recovered. I, I think it's important to have a couple games like that, especially when you're in a transition phase like this and installing new offense. You you have you yes you practice all all fall and you get everything ready but you you need that time to get it done on the field players to make plays it it's different and by the time that they end up getting into conference play they'll have a better idea of who they are where last year i mean they didn't, they didn't even have braylon allen at the beginning of the year you know he wasn't a guy who was cemented in the rotation and they were, had chess Mal- malusi trying to kind of take over a workhorse back position mm-hmm. that he was maybe ready for right away. The offense didn't know who they were. They didn't have an identity. And unfortunately they ran into Penn state right away who did know who they were. Let me, let me finish with this on the staff. Uh, buy or sell this year's coaching staff is better than last year's coaching staff. I'm going to buy that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it because we're going to get something a little bit different on offense, and it's hard to imagine the offense being any less efficient than it's been the last two seasons. I think the offensive line play will go from good to hopefully pushing great like it used to be. I, I do expect that the coaching staff as a whole will be at the very least marginally better this season. Yep, I'm on board with you there. Even even like I talked about, like we've discussed some of the concerns I've had with people coaching new positions. I think what you brought up, uh, Dylan, with Bob Bosted moving over, I think that's a major, major win. And I love um, Bobby Ingram coming down too. So I agree with you on that. Coming up, guys, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the other big dynamic that happened in the offseason with Dylan, the kind of in, in-house recruiting staff coming together. We're going to talk a little bit, chop it up with the timeline of that. You know, did the Badgers wait a little too long? And then is there hope for the 2023 class? We're going to get into all that and more. Uh, But first, today's show is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I have been on that AG1 for a while, man. I am 39. I just chopped it up with Dylan. He's 29, 10 years older. I got to do a few more things to keep myself in shape. You know, so I've started taking Athletic Greens just a little bit in my water. Um, It's something that gives me a little more immune support. I sleep better with it. I've noticed tangible impacts, guys. And it's lifestyle friendly. Like my wife has all sorts of allergies, you know, so you can take this if you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, something that is going to just mesh with wherever you are at life and life and and help you get to the best version of yourself. It's cheap, less than $3 a day. I spend more than that on my cold brew habit. And it's a company that does amazing things. You know, they've donated 1.2 million meals to kids since 2020. 1.2 million. 
So this is a company when you get into it, you're going to feel better and they're changing the world at the same time. Um, now's the time to reclaim your health, arm up your immune system. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash college. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash college. Take ownership over your health today. Pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And guys, thanks again for making Lockdown Badgers your first listen every day. Starting April 28th, tuned into Locked On NFL Draft Drafts live coverage of the 2022 and into NFL Draft with three days of real-time analysis. Uh, our extensive lineup of experts and insiders. It is something that you are going to enjoy if you're a draft guy. It's coming up this week. Brian Peacock and former NFL scout, scout Matt Williamson uh, will have you covered all the way leading up to the draft. Um, all right, Dylan, let, let's jump into uh, kind of the next big thing that I wanted to hash it out with you. The the Badgers, There was this was a major discussion point internally among, I would call us Badger psycho fans, like the fans that care about recruiting. A lot of Badger fans don't really care. But Wisconsin, since they lost Saeed, uh, Saeed Khalif to Michigan State a year and a half ago, um, basically took a full calendar year-ish to replenish their recruiting staff. Um, and they've done it now. So two-part question. Did it frustrate or concern you that it took that long? And B, do you like where the final kind of result has brought us to? It it definitely was frustrating that it took so long. I I don't really see what anyone in the department would have had to have gained by having waited that long. They essentially just distributed the duties among the people already on the staff and just added more onto their plates than they already had. Um, ultimately, I am very happy with Mickey Turner being the one that takes over. He he played under mm -hmm. or he played at Wisconsin. You know, he's been on Chris coaching staff since 2015 when he took over. Um, I think one thing that actually is going to be beneficial is the fact that he is not from the state of Wisconsin. However, he fell in love with the university and the state and it checked all of his boxes. And he's made it abundantly clear that he intends on trying to, you know, perpetuate that to different recruits throughout the process to let them know, you know, like I didn't essentially know this was going to have everything I needed when I was in the recruiting process, but it became all that and more. Um, he has a strong track record as a recruiter. Um, he's known as very honest and genuine. He's going to represent the program well, you know, build those relationships. I think that he is the right man internally that that they could have chosen to lead the efforts. I think that where they ended is a good place considering how long it took to actually find that replacement. Yeah, I, I love your answer there. And that's actually something I didn't really think about, Dylan, is, is an out-of-state guy becoming that in, that recruiting coordinator. Um, I think that's a great answer. And I, I agree, again, almost wholeheartedly with everything you said. I, I really like where we ended up. I think Chris you know, ended up putting some really good people in place. Some other former players as well are, are on that staff. And if you look at the tight end recruiting, there's been some big wins there. You know, with, uh, Mickey Turner has landed some really good out-of-state talent with major offer lists. So I like all of that. I think it makes a ton of sense. And I love your point about him being an out-of-state guy who fell in love with the university and can really sell it uh, that way. So, yeah, I 100% agree. I do also think, and you mentioned this, the length of time it took to get there uh, was frustrating. And it adds to this idea, fair or not, that Wisconsin at times is – slow a little plotting um is that kind of a fair reputation or is or are people just kind of grasping at straws there i not exactly sure how to answer that i i think that there could be a level of truth to that i don't think they really are in a hurry to do much of anything and a lot of times they they hire from within or someone that they've worked with in the past and so i i don't think that a lot of their hires are maybe quite as widespread as some other locations what about i i think i didn't use the best word methodical to a fault is probably a better word than plotting like i definitely there's definitely value um and, and i want to make it out that this is not all a bad thing there's definitely value in ensuring that you get the right people in place right too many universities rush into hires they make mistakes they get caught in this death spiral of always changing things you know paul christ is not that there's a continuity with him that he really values um, I just think at times we, we probably fall too far on that that methodical side of the scale. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, ultimately, Wisconsin has an identity. They've known what that is for a long time. And a lot of the people still associated with the football program have all extended from a lot of similar coaching trees. And I, I, I 
they're not changing who they are. That's not going to happen. And so I, I do think that ultimately it does often make sense to hire somewhere, someone within or someone with close ties because they, they know who they are, they know what they want to do, and finding someone who can help perpetuate that is ultimately what's going to help the culture. Uh, and it's it's a strong culture. Like, you know, there's there's no there's very few programs out there that are more identifiable by a brand, by who they are than Wisconsin. Right. And it's a reason why this program is one of the most consistent winners of anybody. I mean, the ceiling isn't there of Clemson and Ohio state, but you're not going to find a more consistent winning team. And the culture plays a huge part in that. So we also need to to really understand that and, and embrace it because there's a, it could be much, much worse. I know fans are always looking for that next level and recruiting and, and that ceiling, this is these are the good old these are good days for Wisconsin football and basketball and I think people need to realize that as well. Absolutely, it's not to be taken for granted. I mean, everyone's always they 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 want they're always concerned about you know getting the next shiny toy or trying to be the next big thing. But I mean, a lot of the universities that do that look at like a USC. They've been mm-hmm. chasing that for a long time, and maybe they have it in Lincoln Riley now, but been a long time since Pete Carroll left that they've been chasing that shiny toy and they have not been able to get back to that winning culture. That's a hundred percent agree. Hey, do you think um, going, staying with our recruiting talk here, the 2023 class currently uh, last in the big 10, Tyler Jancy is the lone, a lone commit of a good inside linebacker commit out of state is still, this is not a very good start for Wisconsin. Um, How concerned are you? How, able is Wisconsin to maybe turn this around for 2023 or with all the recruiting shifting that was happening with the lack of an in-state class that's very strong this year is 2023 kind of a I don't want to say lost cause but definitely an area of concern it it is a little bit of an area of concern uh like as you mentioned the lack of an in-state class is the probably the most significant reason that Mm -hmm. That that they're starting out a little bit of a deficit. Um, you know, they do have a couple in-state kids that they are in close communication with right now. But beyond that, I don't think we're going to have the star power uh, that we did maybe two years ago. Obviously, they're in deep with Tackett Curtis. That would be a home run. That's somebody that we're, you know, a lot of eggs are in that basket. He, that could help save the class in a lot of ways. And I'm not saying this is going to be a bad one by any means. They're in on plenty of talented players, but... I don't think we're going to see a lot of four-star players in this recruiting class. Yeah, uh, you just brought up one of my favorite guys in this this entire class. Tat Curtis's film is unreal. Absolutely phenomenal. (laughs) I haven't hardly seen anything like it. It's incredible. Where would he rank? I want to just put you on the spot here. Uh, Where would Tack rank among recent recruiting wins for Wisconsin? I mean, you have some uh, five-star out-of-state offensive linemen. You have a guy like Nick Herbig, who's obviously out-of-state. But where would Tack rank, given his pedigree, the position he plays, where he's from in the country, his offer list, et cetera, et cetera? As far as I'm concerned, this would be the same level of a victory as like a Nolan Rucci. I mean, I know that Rucci was a five-star talent. He had every school in the country after him. But I think that he has, coming in, he would have the highest ceiling of any linebacker recruit that we've had in quite some time. I, I think that he would be right up there among the highest recruiting wins in school history. Thankfully, they identified him as early as they did, and they're in deep with him. Hopefully, they can find a way to close it out. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I recently talked to his head coach down in Louisiana, and they actually reached out to Wisconsin first. They sent really? the film. Yeah, they. it's really interesting. So they identified, um, he said, like eight to ten-ish programs that they they really love the culture of, and Wisconsin was one of those programs. So they sent the film out through an intermediary to Bobby April. Um, that was the first time April saw it. And then April immediately reached out, right? You imagine being an outside linebacker coach and that film comes in your inbox. Like <laughs> It was immediately yeah. reached back out. Yeah. It's super interesting. Yeah. That's unbelievable. He, he would be a terrific fit at Wisconsin. I agree. I, I would actually say it's, if you're talking recent recruiting, I think it's bigger than the five-star offensive lineman. Just because those guys are are Midwest guys like Logan Brown and Rucci are Midwest guys, I think it's easier to sell Wisconsin. And the offensive line pedigree is there. And Rucci obviously had his brother here. I think recent recruiting wins, tell me if you think I'm wrong. I think it goes, and again, we're only talking about recruiting wins. I think it goes Mertz, and it would go Tackett number two if we were to land Tackett. I, I think that's a really fair assessment. Mertz was obviously the biggest one in in recent memory 
at least at least in my lifetime and regardless how it's panned out thus far there's not a school in the country that wouldn't have been happy to have landed mm-hmm. yep 100 percent agree all right, guys, oh, we're going to continue this with Dylan. Um, I love this conversation already. We're going to jump into Mertz, and I'm going to get his pick his brain a little bit on if he thinks there's a chance if Mertz struggles this year, we could turn to somebody else. Uh, but first, we're going to go into our next uh, sponsor of the show, next friend of the show, that's Bet Bet BetOnline is your number one source for all your college football, all or not college football, sorry, um, NFL futures, basketball playoffs, ma- uh, Major League Baseball is in swing now. All your sports betting needs are on Bet Online. Some really fun future stuff with college football, is, which is where I was going. If you think Braylon Allen can win the Heisman, you can get that 50 to 1 right now. Caleb Williams, right? We all remember that summer saga. He landed in a pretty good spot out on the left coast, uh, 15 to 2 to win the Heisman. We know what Riley's system does for quarterbacks. So it's a fun way. You can kind of put a few dollars out there. And if you have a hunch on somebody blowing up, now's the time to do it. Bet online is the number one spot for your sports developments, podcasts, newsletters, reviews of leagues coming up, where the next coach is going to land. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your source for uh, live betting, favorite Vegas casino games, roulette, blackjack. Head to the website today. Use your mobile device. Learn more about the trends and actions. Uh, BetOnline, where the game starts. And I see Dylan back in. I love it. Hey, and we got we got video. Yeah, I don't know what changed. <laughs> I love it. No, we've been waiting for it. Um, so, yeah, I kind of wanted to just jump back in. And I appreciate you coming back. What does a, a realistic jump from Mertz look like? I think that it looks more like 15, 16 touchdowns and hopefully less than eight interceptions. Honestly, if he can be an efficient passer and just take care of the football, I think that you see a significant difference on offense. That'd be it. I, I, I mean, that's a win. I, I think most realistic Badgers would take that and run with it, with the defense we're going to have and with Braylon Allen behind him. Um, I do want to ask you this question. This was this was thrown at us on Twitter by somebody. Let's say Mert struggles again. He, is there any chance the the coaching staff could turn to Chase Wolf or Deacon Hill at some point this year, barring a Mertz injury? Honestly, I I don't think the answer to that is yes. Uh, Chase Wolf, I think that he is who he is at this point. He's plenty talented. He's a mobile quarterback, but he's somebody who's fairly reckless with the football. If he was someone who could come in and just take care of the ball, do all the little things, perhaps he would be in the discussion. But I, I don't think he's someone who gives you a better chance to win than Mertz does. And as far as Deacon Hill, even though the guy's got a live arm and a lot of talent, I don't think he at this point is probably anywhere near ready to see the field. I understand that, you know, at, at a certain point, what do you have to lose by getting the guy some on field experience? But I think right now that. This is Mertz's. This is Mertz's room, and I, mm-hmm. I, I just don't see them making a change really under any circumstance. Did they? Did the staff make a mistake not bringing in somebody to challenge Mertz this off season? And that doesn't mean Caleb Williams. I, I think Caleb Williams is a bit of a pipe dream. But could you have found a somebody in the transfer portal, or was that was that not realistic? Even honestly, I would have liked to have seen it. I, I think that the coaching staff probably feels the same way they do about their quarterback room right now that they did at the end of last year. And if you're not happy with what you got last season and you're looking for more, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't bring in some kind of competition. I I would have liked to have seen a veteran quarterback brought in that could at the very least, if Graham wasn't getting it done, someone who could come in and tread water, hopefully a better option than Chase Wolf. Agreed. You and I, Dylan, are on are, we're simpatico right now. I do want to jump into some let's get some positive stuff here with the offense. Cause I we talked and brought up Mertz a lot, and Mertz has been a bit of a conundrum. Um, I think the receivers are gonna be better this year. I, I saw your take on you know players that have improved their the most, uh their stock the most in spring practice. Again, everyone should go out there and follow Dylan, by the way, read his stuff, uh, really good stuff. You a couple you mentioned a couple receivers in your article. Um, I think the receivers are gonna be better this year. Do you agree, disagree? I do agree. I think that while this room might reach its ceiling next year because of how young they are, that a guy like Jim Ray DK, I think he's a true number one receiver. Skylar Bell, it's really encouraging to see, you know, the reports coming out of spring practice because he's a terrific athlete and someone who adds a different dynamic to this offense. You know, maybe he can be what you wanted Kendrick Pryor to be. Kendrick Pryor was a guy who, you know, had all the athletic tools in the world, but maybe wasn't, he was, he was easily, 
redirected off of his routes and mm-hmm. he wasn't maybe a true football player. He was just a good athlete and perhaps Skylar Bell can offer something like that. Keontes Lewis is a big bodied receiver from UCLA who I think is going to see the field right away. I think those top three guys, there are a lot to be excited about. And I think that ultimately they offer a higher ceiling than the group that we had last year. Marcus Allen, Dean Ingram. Uh, I, I thought Ingram should have stayed at corner, uh, but he, he's a, he's got some good reviews at, from from spring. He's pretty quick. Which of those players makes more of an impact this year? I have to imagine that it's Marcus Allen. I, I still expect him to carve out a pretty significant role on this offense. He, he He's a guy who can win on the outside, and a guy like DK is probably best suited performing most of his snaps out of the slot. And so I think that the boundary – Boundary receiver spots are going to be open, and that's what's going to be available with the most open snaps. I do think Marcus Allen ends up forcing his way in there. Ingram probably is also going to see the field. I expect them to have five guys that see the field, but I don't think that necessarily means five guys that are you know actively involved in the offense and catching a lot of passes. Right. This is Wisconsin after all. Yeah. Um, let's let's wrap up on this because we are losing Jake. Wisconsin is losing Jake Ferguson. Right. You and I agree. I think the receivers, we both think the receivers are going to be better. Are they going to be better enough to offset the loss of Jake Ferguson, given how injury real the tight end position is for like the third straight year? They're going to need to be because Ferguson was, you know, Mertz safety valve in a lot of ways. And I think that probably plays a role in why DK is going to be playing in the slot as much as he is because he needs someone to you can get the ball out of his hands quickly, too, and that he trusts. The tight end room right now, it's its so hard to even judge them because they haven't been able to be healthy. You don't really know what you have right now. I mean, you have guys like Clay Cundiff and Jack Eschenbach that I think can be plenty serviceable and are, you know, can play snaps. But again, they have to get healthy. I, I do think that the receiving group can help take some of the load off. I think it probably evens out, truthfully. Okay. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Last question on this, and then I want to get into where everyone can find your your content. Because, again, I think it's super valuable, guys. Um, confidence level 1 out of 10 on the offense this year. Where are you at? 10 being that 2010, those those incredible Wisconsin teams, and 1 being the beginning of last year. I'm going to go a 6.5. I have confidence that it is going to be improved. I, I truly mean that. I don't think that. It's going to look insanely different. I don't think that we're all of a sudden going to be coming out and hanging 35 a game. But I do think it'll be better than last season. And I'd love to be proved wrong. I'd love for it to be better than that. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm probably about there, too, to be honest. I think you and I agree a lot on the offensive side of this. Um, Dylan, where, again, thank you for coming on. Always gracious with your time. Uh, where can Thanks everyone find me. your stuff? Yeah, of course, man. Um, I write for the Badgers Wire over at USA Today and at, for the Badger of Honor over on the Fan Sided Network. And for anyone who has any interest in more Badger basketball content, I will be uh, creating my own Substack uh, newsletter for people to follow. Uh, it'll be Badger Notes at badgernotes.substack.com. That'll be coming in the following weeks for fans who want to get a little bit deeper dive into the film, some of the analytics, kind of understand the program from a little bit deeper standpoint. Oh, I love that. Um, we'll definitely link that in the show, and that's definitely something I'll dig into. I, I definitely uh, – again, guys, uh, Dylan is somebody you guys have to follow on Twitter if you're a Badger fan. Uh, really sharp, lots of good content, constant content, content as well. So um, as long as he's willing, we're going to keep having him on the show. Really appreciate it, Dylan. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. All right, guys. Uh, thank you again for uh, watching, tuning in, uh, wherever you're finding the show, whether it's on iTunes, uh, podcasts, YouTube. Again, we really appreciate the support, guys. The community is growing, and that's what it's all about, bringing a bunch of Badger fans together to talk about it. So thanks for making Locked On Badgers your first listen, um, really, each and every day. Thanks for going to YouTube and checking it out and subscribing. Guys, the comments and the the you know just the support is, is awesome, and it's humbling, really. Uh, you can find us, as always, on uh, LockedOnBadgers at gmail.com. Reach out on Twitter, LockedOnBadgers. Uh, and then uh, thanks for making you know this show your first one. Coming up, guys, we still have more interviews this week. Uh, we're going to get more into basketball. And then uh, hopefully uh, Thursday or Friday, we're going to get John Garcia, Sports Illustrated's recruiting director, on again. We're going to dive into some bigger picture recruiting topics, where Wisconsin fits in into the national landscape. So stay with us this week. Tons of great content coming out. 
And um, when you're done listening to us, guys, jump over to uh, Locked On NFL Draft. Ryan Tracy and uh, Eric Crocker, former NFL quarterback, they're bringing the NFL Draft to life. Again, this week, it's it's popping off. This is the time to go check them out. All the latest insight and analysis, NFL front offices and prospects, uh, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you guys so much, and we'll talk to you.